I'm recording, right? Mm -hmm. yeah, recording. yeah. Yeah. Oh yeah. Did the physio, like like the Chris Wright thing, did that? Did the Group B one just not record? It was never recording. Like, and it wasn't even like it was kind of confusing. Not gonna lie, like I didn't really get it. There wasn't that much to it though. Oh, good. Yeah. Because I didn't go. I was, no, I, I feel was like I don't. No, I feel like the. The one that I went to with them group I mean like that was pretty helpful. Group B, that was the second one. Yeah. 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 I felt like that was pretty helpful. I still like, I, don't I, I still haven't like, without watched... having read the notes at all and like I still, still haven't watched the glomerular filtration shit yet. What's Wait, that? there is no video. It is just notes, isn't it? I know. Well, I still haven't just like notes. read it. I'm like, oh. oh the notes are beautiful though. Like actually That's true. beautiful. They're pu they're like they're pristine. They're like classic Chris Wright notes. Yeah, classic Chris Wright. I love them. Honestly, I got most of it except for the maths part, and then I'm like, oh my god. Oh, I hip don't should think die. You know the maths part, surely. I think like half the document is just him proving why it is that, but I don't think you actually need to be able to prove it. Right, okay. Just I feel formula. like you just need to know the key, just the formula. Yeah. yeah. Is that everyone? Oh no, there's more people. No, there should be more, but like, I don't know. I reckon I'll just start. 14, one person left though. Can I start? Yeah. Can I just start? Yep, we're starting. Hey Zoe, are you explaining these? Because I haven't looked at this before. Um, yeah, I can explain most of them, I think. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you should be able to explain this one at least. Yeah. Oh yeah, this oh this one. Yeah, this is this is, this is a classic question. Oh, this one. This is the one that I clarified with a few people. Uh -huh. Because yeah. I might have given too much time. How long did you give it? Okay. Oh what? Yeah, okay. So anticholinesterase poisoning. Succimethonium. I mean you probably could, right? Because succimethonium you can reverse the you can reverse it. Like yeah. you can reverse your drugs. Um but yeah, typically I think um so we start off with yellow. Um pyridostigmine would cause your uh, anticholinesterase poisoning because you've given too much and then your ACH levels build up. Um, so pyridostigmine will make it worse. Um, rocuronium, um, the reason why rocuronium and succinethonium are, uh, the reason why those aren't appropriate is because both rocuronium and succinethonium, um, they work at the nicotinic receptors only um, and they don't work at both nicotinic and muscarinic. I'm fairly sure. Um, whereas atropine works at both nicotinic and muscarinic, if I'm not mistaken. Is that and right? I mean, yeah. yeah, so this is something you, like, even if you don't understand this, <laughs> like, it's worth memorizing because it shows up a lot. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah, so basically, like, to put it simply, anticholinesterase means that you can't break down all the acetylcholine in like your synapses. So you have too much like acetylcholine and atropine, I believe is a anti-muscarinic, so it blocks all of them and like prevent it from like kind of being overloaded. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, cool. The first few questions are just a lot of uh, The first farm. few questions are rough. No, they're just all farm questions. Yeah. They're not too bad. Not a response to ACH. Nice. Okay. Um, Okay, so ACH, you have to remember that ACH is like parasympathetic. 
um, so your rest and digest or ACH is also um, responsible for your somatic motor uh, nerves. So like contracting your skeletal muscle. So therefore it can't be blue. Um, blue is incorrect. Um, secretion of products, secretion of products uh, from glands. Um, you can think of that as uh, let's say um, your digestive enzymes. So during the rest and digest, you're going to want to digest things. Yeah. So you're going to secrete things from your glands to help digest that stuff. Um, yeah, and then cardiac. Yes. Yeah. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah. Um, and then decreased contraction of cardiac muscle. So parasympathetic is rest and digest. Um, so therefore, we want to rest our heart and not let it uh, contract so much. Um, the reason why increased cell growth and division is um, correct is why the option of increased cell growth is correct um, is because, yeah, I think cell growth I mean, and division is just a bit of a long-term response, right? Yeah, and I admit this question is not a very good one, but it's kind of like the other three are very clearly incorrect. <laughs> so this is also the case where you just take the best, I mean, the least bad answer. Yeah. Um, and like cell growth and cell division, you're generally thinking mitosis and stuff like that, and you generally won't really get it, like as an immediate response to acetylcholine. Yeah, it takes longer for your cells to grow than that. Okay. Oh, what the heck? <laughs> Or imagine if Richard was actually here, and then... <laughs> um, this is for one of the indications of one of the drugs. Um, you can definitely rule out two of them. Two of them you could probably want to think about a bit more. Okay, well, um, the ones that should have been ruled out were red and green, uh, which I'm glad that a lot of you got. Um, uh, the reason why is because acetylcholine would cause your trachea to like, like it would cause muscular contraction. Um, so that would make intubation really difficult. Um, atropine doesn't concern skeletal muscle, so it wouldn't really do anything. Um, and then rocuronium and succinethonium, they're very similar acting drugs. Um, like they have the same kind of end effect, um, except, except succinethonium is depolarizing. Um, whereas rocuronium is non-depolarizing. Um, so succinethonium will overactivate them and it will cause the channels to just stop working, um, whereas succinethonium will just block it. Um, and it's simply a question to do with the indications. Um, succinethonium is used for tracheal intubation. Um, yeah. Anything to add? There is a bit of a crossover between the two. Like, they do use rock as well, but I think in this case, mainly you use... So rock is mainly used for sedation. So succinethonium we use like, like initially, I think for the first dosage in for tracheal intubation, because like it's really uncomfortable, right? So you want to kind of knock them out a little bit. And then rocuronium you add as like the maintenance in a sense. Like I'm not sure if that's entirely correct, but that's like from my understanding of how they usually go about. Um, so they use both hand in hand. It, it does often work together. Yeah, so the paralysis or the effect of succinethonium lasts a lot shorter um, than uh, rocuronium. And succinethonium has a shorter half-life. That just means that its effects will last a lot shorter. And so the significantly shorter duration of action of succinethonium, essentially, um, that's one of the main reasons uh, why clinicians tend to focus that one for things such as intubation. Mm. I don't know if you guys have covered this before, but kind of just think about it and try and logic through it. I don't think they have. <laughs> uh, well, yeah, you can try just logic through it. Yeah, I think, I think that you if you use the general principles, it yeah. should make sense. Yep, so as a reminder, beta is uh, adrenergic, so it'll activate your sympathetic. Whoops, gave the answer. <laughs> 
I'll shut up. <laughs> um, okay. So as I was saying, um, beta receptors are your sympathetic nervous system. Um, so therefore, it would not be um, red or green or A and D. Um, so yeah, so activating a beta receptor will be activating the sympathetic uh, nervous system. Um, and it's activating because it's an agonist. Yes, agonist is important to use. Like even though inhibiting one will kind of increase the action of the other, there's a difference between stopping the other and just making one more. Oh, good point. So this one is, um, this is salbutamol. So it's used for relieving acute asthma attacks. This is kind of a weird case because we're talking about smooth muscle within the actual like lungs and like the bronchi bronchioles in the lungs. So salbutamol, you kind of want to, like if you're going for a run, your sympathetic nervous system is going to be activated. You want your bronchioles to open up, right? So you want to relax your smooth muscles in your like lungs. Yes. So in this case, it is smooth muscle relaxation. It's a tricky one. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, so your beta 2 receptors. Um, we have two types of beta receptors. We have beta 1 and beta 2. Uh, we have one heart. So therefore, beta-1 receptors are in your heart. We have two lungs, so therefore your beta-2 receptors are in your lungs. Um, and if they activate your sympathetic nervous system, um, that's going to be like your fight or flight. So you'll want to get as much, you're going to want to get as much oxygen into your lungs as possible um, so you don't die. Um, so, and we're going to be activating the sympathetic response. So if we kind of consider those few things, then we can rule out our answers. Uh, so it can't be D because we'll be activating the sympathetic response. It can't be C um, because it's an agonist and it's not going to be inhibiting anything. Uh, same reasoning for, uh, for A. Um, we're actually going to be activating the sympathetic response um, and that leaves us with B. So it's activating the sympathetic response which is going to relax our muscle in our lungs to get as much oxygen into our lungs as possible. Does that make a bit more sense um, to people? Um, this is like also jumping forward into it, like a tiny bit of semester two stuff, I think, maybe, but it'll probably just take a long time to work through the answer. got cut off wait no is a uh, immune system caused by the immune system recognizing skeletal muscles receptors at neuron endings and destroying them so it's asking which neuron receptors are getting destroyed by this disease sorry no. i didn't realize i had a word limit Wow, there's a long time limit. Yeah. I, Wait, we've got 50 yeah. minutes, but I think we can, can we skip the time? Yeah, skip. Help? I mean, it's not a very good question. Yeah. Um, yeah, that's like saying, which receptor does myasthenia gravis affect? Yes. Um, yeah. Um, but I think we'll, like, we'll put these questions in a Word document, so um, you'll be able to like get the full question afterwards. Oh, this is another random little fact. Can you explain this one, Zoe, please? Yeah. Thanks. Um, basically, this is just something you need to memorize. Um, yeah, it's just something you have to memorize. <laughs> Uh, I don't even it's remember. Because it's hard. 
Yeah, heart damage is one of the contraindic. I mean, not the. It's one of the adverse effects of doxorubicin. Um, funny thing about a vancomycin is that vancomycin isn't a cancer drug. I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, yeah, but yeah, it's one of the main like buzzwordy uh, adverse effects of that drug. Yeah, I did not know that. Today I won't. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Yeah, farm is always difficult, I think, especially on a time limit. Which is true about veins. Well, is this week at? Uh, I don't actually remember. Hmm. I, I was kind of desperate for questions, so I kind of just put whatever. Yeah, fair enough. Anyway, it's good. It's good revision either, yeah. either way. Nice. Yeah, it's um, very nice. Yeah, so um, so we'll go through the answers. So red, um, they are valveless. Uh, that's incorrect because it's actually your arteries that are valveless, and then your veins have valves to prevent uh, like blood pooling up at the bottom of your legs. Um, so it kind of stops it from backflowing because it's at a lower pressure. Um, blue is incorrect because veins are under lower pressure. Um, so you can think of it as kind of being... Uh, further down the further down your like blood vessels from your heart so you're going to get less positive like it's less um, it's less pressurized um, and then green is incorrect because capillary beds are kind of um, they're all continuous so your capillaries your arterial side of the capillaries will slowly turn into the venous side of the capillaries um, so it's never a free ending um, I think the one with free endings uh, that's lymphatics I believe yeah. Um, and yellow is correct because, um, yeah, veins aren't, aren't under as much pressure. So you need kind of like an external force to squeeze the blood back up your veins. Um, and that's why like, if you're on a plane for too long and you don't move your legs, then blood can pull up. And that's why your like legs swell a tiny bit. And some people get, um, like a clot forming in their legs, uh, because the blood hasn't been moving around, um, enough. Yeah. And that thing where you use the muscle movement to return blood to the heart is called a muscular venous pump. So like whenever you look at diagrams, you usually see like diagrams of calves where like if you you know go for a walk, you kind of work those calves and like kind of pump the blood back into your heart. Cool. Oh yes, another random fact. Um, yep, so P53, that's a, um, that's one of your, um, uh, what's it called? Uh, one of the regulators, um, BRCA1 is one of the genes associated with breast cancer risk. Um, tyrosine kinase, I believe, is to do with your, um, your estrogen-related breast cancer, I think, um, and these get activated during breast cancer. Is that right, Zoe? Uh, I'm actually not too sure, but it's I'm not the answer to this question. I'm pretty sure it is. Um, yeah. Yeah, so like v, VEGF is one of those things secreted, um, and it causes yeah, and, your blood vessels to grow. Yeah, and it stands for vascular endothelial growth factor, so the, word, the name itself kind of makes sense. Yeah, um, yeah tyrosine kinase. Yeah. Um, tyrosine kinase is one of the targets uh, for an anti-cancer drug. Um, yeah. Oh, the option kind of got cut off. Oh, not sure. Um, okay. 
it. Oh, oof. That's not true. So which one is false? Um, so you get tumors in both eyes because this, like this RB, this faulty RB is present in every single uh, cell of your body. Um, so therefore, if it's present in both eyes, you're going to get tumors in both eyes, unfortunately. Um, so blue is true. Um, I think it's a hundred percent, if I'm not mistaken, um, who have this mutant RB develop the tumor. Um, so I think it's a hundred percent penetrance. Um, and then two somatic acquired mutations. Um, what's the uh, it's acquired. It says it's acquired mutations. Oh, yeah. So these are, you're born with it. So it's not acquired. Yeah. Um, and it's present on chromosome 13, not 15. <laughs> um, yeah, so hereditary, um, every single cell of your body has it. So it's not going to be acquired. It's just going to be passed down. Uh, which is the main thing to take, I think, from this, from the yellow option here. Um, yeah, so it's on chromosome 13. That was mean. How would I go on this test? I don't know. Oh yeah, this one I just grabbed off tiny slide. This wasn't in the nutrition module. <laughs> That's what I was thinking for a second. I was like, I don't know, this sounds like something we've done. Uh, pure fact. Yeah, um, just remember it as a statistic. It was in Craig Hassard's slides and one of the more important ones. Yeah. Yeah, so the 17 was out of the seven, out of the uh, 19. Uh, oh, sorry, don't say it. I'm going to shut up. That's the next question. <laughs> <laughs> okay, next question. Next question. Guys, you didn't hear any of that. Mm -mm. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, nice. Wow, I wonder what the answer is. <laughs> Hope you were listening to what Jiting was saying. Otherwise, if you didn't, that's okay. <laughs> nice. Another fact that you have to remember. Yeah, um, just a fact. Yeah. I think, like, what I always try to do for these HEP questions is if it seems something bad, I always pick like one of the lower percentages because it's normally yeah. <laughs> correct. Like it's normally one of those shock factors. Um, yeah. False regarding anastomosis. Um, cool. So I'll start off with option with the blue option. So extensive movement, um, you're going to want anastomosis there, uh, because say if, um, say if I have like one artery going down, like my arm, right. And then I bent my arm and then suddenly I blocked off that blood supply. And now my whole hand and my whole forearm doesn't have any blood. Um, that's a bad thing, right? So we want to avoid it. Um, so to avoid that, we're going to have kind of alternative pathways for the blood to get through um, around that location of movement. Um, so that's why blue is incorrect. Um, yeah, yellow anastomoses, that's their function to give alternative pathways for blood flow. Um, and then them providing links between arteries and arterioles uh, without a capillary bed. Um, their connection oh wait what i don't think it's i think it's just um it wouldn't be between arteries and arterioles i don't think i think they'd just mm -hmm. be yeah i think they'd just be arterioles really yeah at that size yeah um that's a weird so these, question sorry yeah <laughs> anastomoses are kind of like um they're relatively smaller blood vessels um compared to like your arteries which can be pretty large um yeah, and green is incorrect because of option blue. Um, they'll occur at your places of movement. So your knee, your 
your knee, your elbow, your foot, etc. Oh, hip on top. Spelling error. Oops. <laughs> no, I've I've just stopped caring about spelling and like even my notes are full of like grammar and spelling errors. I've yeah. just given up. I turned spell check just, off. There's too much you get through. If I was like, yeah, screw that. As long as I can read it and understand it, it's fine. Oh, nice. Ten percent. Oh wow, nice. Um Yeah, it's I think it's yeah, that's another fact that you need to know. Can't really explain it. Gentle guana. So, yeah. Classic. Have you guys done the Ornish program? I hope you guys have. Yeah, they have. It's in the um, it's in Craig Hassard's lecture. I don't think I. I think you talked about it. Um, I mentioned it, but I didn't go through it in detail in my slides because I just assumed that Craig Hassard would go through it. It's a vegetarian diet, guys. <laughs> not not vegan, it's vegetarian, but that's basically, yeah, that's it. Right. And oh, it's, yeah, it's probably not... worth, yeah, actually learning all the different components or parts of the Ornish program. The Ornish program and the Mediterranean diet. Uh, yeah. They're like Craig's favorite um, diets. Yep. Um, cool. So a bit of a, a bit of a difficult farmer quiz, I think. Um, but yeah, farmer is kind of like a um, yeah, farmer's a bit rough uh, for a while, like a good while. Um, vegetarian for CVD Ornish and vegan for cancer Ornish. Um, I could not answer that. There's a difference. Sorry. <laughs> what? Sorry. Guys, sorry. Wait, wait, wait. Oh, yeah, sorry. I I actually cut out the word CBD. I probably should have kept that in there. <laughs> That's my bad. You're probably right. Okay. Um, we'll fix up. But then it's also, I developed hypertension, which is a CBD issue. Oh, uh, yeah. Oh, yeah, that's true. Yeah. Yeah. There you go. Pay attention to the question. Um, but we'll like add in some clarifications into that um, yes. afterwards. Yeah, cool. Um, let's start presenting them. I think we're starting with microbio. Yeah, guys, it's it's a it's a big week. Yeah, introduced to this is I think this is the start of your microbio kind of. <gasps> Did you guys have right? Meredith? Have you guys had Meredith yet? She's amazing. Jating, we get to fangirl about Meredith for like oh the my next God, three I weeks. Love her. <laughs> I parked next to her once. Oh, she's she's just such a queen. Like, oh, she's just amazing. Who's first on microbiome? I think I am. Ah, uh, yeah, David. Thank you. Um, There's so much microbiome this week. It's like. Can someone share slides for me? Oh, Is do you want me to? Is that okay? Thanks. Yeah. Yeah, honey. Thank you. Awesome. Okay, so we're just going to start off today with microbio. Like, it's one of my favorite topics, and I think it's one of the most fun things and the more many part of um, semester one that you'll probably come into because you actually like learn about the bacteria and like the drugs that will be used to actually um, kind of uh, help the patient get better. So you, it is more relevant, it feels. Um, whereas, like in other, dis like in biochem, you guys don't really look at this specific diseases or things like that. So but microbiome is definitely a really good one. All right, so for natural barriers, just a reminder that quickly, um, you basically go through immunology somewhat again. Um, I'm not gonna go over it too much as we have already done it. So just look back at the other notes if you're not too sure. Okay, so disease and immunity, just quickly refresh. So disease is basically when the structure or the function goes haywire, like it's stuffed up, like that's why disease occurred. And there's often like a range of diseases, things that can cause these diseases. So they can go from like these bacteria, um, just like Staph aureus or just these things on your skin. Fungi, uh, we usually like kind of know them as like kind of shrooms or these um, spores and yeasts, similar to fungus. 
uh, viruses, coronavirus, everyone knows. Uh, protozoa and helminths are more like parasites, and we'll also be covering that today. So that's like your um, good old worms and things like that. It's pretty gross. Don't look at the images. Um, your adaptive and immune uh, systems, we've already talked about that. So your uh, immune system is separated into an adaptive, which works over, um, gets better as time goes on. So it's like 14 days onwards. Whereas your innate immune system is like, wait, this thing isn't right. And then it's going to immediately attack. So we also have this idea of not just like these chemicals kind of protecting us, but there's also like anatomical and mechanical barriers. So it's like physically protecting us as well. Can you think of any? Okay. So some anatomical and mechanical barriers just like include your skin. So like your skin here, like it's always protecting you. Um, it's just like a physical barrier and there's also commensal bacteria on it. And basically what that means is like there's bacteria that's just like, chilling out on your skin and it doesn't actually just chill out but actually somehow protects you a little bit by like um protecting protecting you by preventing other bacteria from like invading so they're like no this is my swamp so then they're like you can't so that you, uh the other bacteria doesn't come and invade uh, mucus membrane like just think about mucus uh, like when you're sick you have like phlegm and everything so all of this kind of mucus like sticky sticky stuff protects you as well as bacteria goes in and then stops it from uh, progressing onwards in your uh, respiratory tract your gastrointestinal tract as well as like your genito urinary tract so all of this added together um, produces this sort of protective barrier and within that the mechanical Barriers include like the mucus ciliary escalator. I'm sure you guys have done looked at that in your histology briefly. So essentially, what that is is like just like these like um, cilia that just kind of gets the mucus to go upwards, and vomiting, sneezing, and all of these things. While they are quite uncomfortable, is an uh, important part of our mechanical barriers. So okay, so antimicrobial factors like what are they, right? So antimicrobial factors essentially are intrinsic parts of our immune system that kind of uh, attacks these bacteria immediately. So like fatty acids on the skin can be produced by like these commensal bacteria I was talking about. Um, other things like include gastric acids and pepsin. So they're just like, you know, they just, they were just like chilling and breaking down food, but at the same time they can keep the low pH. So very acidic environments can also kill these bacteria. Lysosomes, lysozymes, sorry, um, you guys already know as well through uh, within the cells, they can actually break down the bacterial wall. And without the bacterial wall, these organisms uh, die as well. Um, cytokines, chemokines, like they're just the, uh, chemical messengers. And like once they tell there's an infection, these other things like complement pathways can start occurring. And information can also progress to allow um, this sort of response to. Uh, this pathogen that's currently creating this disease, this uh, destruction function or structure. So what is inflammation? All right, the best way I can think of inflammation is like, think of it as like you're holding a hot potato, right? Like if it's hot, like what's going to happen, right? Your hand, it's going to be so hot, your hand's going to be burning. So that's the heat. And then if it's hot, like it's scathing, your hand suddenly becomes red and then there's going to be a lot of pain and after the pain you start swelling and then you just your hand gets huge right so after all of this what happens well you can't actually use your hand to like type messages as fast because of uh, the loss of function so they often use like gladden for it so uh, redness is like group or heat is calor so like calories is heat swelling or oh, typo there so swelling is um tumor so it's like a it's like cancer so tumor um, and then pain is dolor and loss of function is like Lisa Fusk. I forgot the exact word, but you can search it up. Um, they do go over that again in the heme lectures, like Jen Ling, we, I think she covers that again. So local inflammation is actually really good because it stops prevention. So when we think of inflammation, it's actually currently occurring in, in some small part of your body to protect this inflammation. And most of the time you can't actually feel it. However, when it does get, um, to a significant extent, that's where a lot of the pain and loss of function starts occurring. Um, so tumor necrosis factor and interleukin, so that's your TNF alphas and your IL1s, make these endothelial cells leak fluid and more stick for WBCs. So I try to dumb, dumb it down a lot, which I just wanted to cover the main idea. Mary doesn't really expect you to know all the 
very specific um, immunology parts of this. So I'm just focusing on the microbiology and the protective factors that we do have. So essentially, uh, by allowing the endothelial cells to be more sticky, allows the double, uh, so the white blood cells to just essentially uh, roll along the endothelium walls better and allow for better movement. Okay, so this is a quick image of showing it. So it's just showing like the constriction, inflammation, and the migration of the white blood cells outwards and allows the rolling of these white blood cells. Yeah. All right, so pyrexia, what is pyrexia? So that's essentially just uh, your fever. It's a natural response. It keeps, um, it does happen and it accompanies inflammation. Well, something is wrong when pyrexia happens. So when we need to think of fever, like why do we want to increase the internal body temperature? Think back to chemistry in three, four, like you guys um, hopefully did like equilibrium in high school. So it just talks about uh, by increasing the temperature within, you can actually increase the rate of reaction and this allows for fast immune responses as well. Clinically, we do say it's over 38 degrees. However, most textbooks say it's more than 37. Um, although that's probably like a bit too low given the fact that some people's natural body resting temperature is like around 37 or even a bit higher. Um, some temperatures are too high for bacteria to survive so their bacterial walls might actually get broken down and this could lead to um, like bactericidal effects so killing of bacteria. Um, so just be careful though like because prolonged fever of course will lead to many side effects including delirium. So I was talking about normal flora, right? Like when we're talking about commensal flora. So when we think about normal flora, it's actually in a lot of places on our body. Um, you come out of uh, the maternal body like with no normal flora, but as time goes on quickly, you actually do gain your own set of normal flora. And it's really important. Well, because you have this like in your nasal cavity, you have in your mouth, you have it on your skin, your large intestine, where there's like millions of bacteria to help digestion. So all of these things play their own specific role. And as you guys go through the different, um, as you go through the different body systems later on in this year and throughout year two, you'll definitely go look into microbiology uh, specifically as to what is residing at each location. The most specific and most important parts for you guys to know though, is that you need to know which areas do not have these commensal bacteria because they'll often say like, okay, so this patient comes in with a milky uh, cerebrospinal fluid. So immediately, like you know, this patient uh, has an infection. It could be meningitis. So by looking, by knowing which areas should not have these commensal bacteria, we can more specifically and immediately identify um, identify if there is infection happening. Also, if you look at the diagram, it says like SPP a lot. Um, I wasn't too sure what that meant last year, but it just mean, it means species. So if you look at skin, it says like staphylococcus, it just means species, like there's different ones, like aureus and things like that. Okay, so normal flora, like some just chill out for a bit and leave, those are just called transient. Those that stay forever are called your resident flora. So what do they actually do? Well, resident flora is um, more so in your, on your skin, just block off other bacterias from invading. They kind of like um, just crowd the areas and prevent uh, colonization of these other more deadly bacterias that could invade and they also produce fatty acids um, that's why sometimes your skin feels uh, oily and this isn't good for other invaders as well gut bacteria um, more uh, more specifically in your large intestines so they help us digest a lot of food and produce like really important things such as intrinsic factors and these intrinsic factors can help us produce like vitamin b12 and you need vitamin b12 for uh, to prevent like anemia so they have a lot of functions in just like the normal functions of uh, your body. And it's also like immune system training ground. Like your, your train, uh, like these white blood cells and stuff, they sometimes just go and just like practice. It's probably less graphic than they make it out to be called training ground, but it is a good way to think about it as your own like commensal bacteria gives a good opportunity for immune system to start building up its strengths. If you think about like being a baby, like, being a baby, like you still need to start building up your adaptive immune system, and that's the way you go through it, like through your own bacteria first, and then you get to like the real fight with like 
I don't know, coronavirus or something. Hopefully not. <laughs> so E. coli. Everyone like kind of hears about E. coli. Um, I'm sure you might have heard about this before even med school. Well, E. coli is a really good example for mu mutualism. What does that mean? It's just like best buds, you know, and, like they're kind of helping each other out. This is what I was talking about before about um, E. coli in your colon, like colon is just your large intestines. So uh, producing like vitamin K and these other essential vitamins. So essential just means that your body cannot produce them on their own and uh, it must have these other factors helping you to produce it, whether from diet or these bacteria. So let's say the bacteria gets a slice of the pizza, right? It's happy too because it gets a constant food supply. Well, commensalism means like you're kind of just chilling. It's like bacteria and you chilling in a hot tub but six feet apart, you're not doing anything. So you're just kind of there, okay? Um, parasitism, well, obviously, like, it's like one of your friends is like stealing, is it five feet? Okay, damn it. My, my main game, not strong enough. Okay, so like, parasitism, like, have you guys seen that meme where it's like the guy who pays for it and then like four parasites on the Netflix? That's like me to hide his account right now. Um, but essentially, it's just like the guy who leeches off your Netflix. So it does cause infection and there's a lot of side effects too. And the parasites win, and because not necessarily just bacteria or parasites. So in some recent years, trying to make this a little bit more relevant, in COVID-19, like there's a lot of people who are carriers, and so active means like you're really sick, like you're currently fighting the inf uh, infection. Incubatory is like you're kind of waiting, and then it will just like burst out. So COVID-19, that's why we have the self-isolation period of 14 days, so just to see if you are within the incubation period. And convalescent means like, whoa, you've recovered, um, that's good. Um, but you could still be a carrier. So there is a bit of crossover between the two. Um, herpes, so that's like your household chicken pox. Like, I'm not sure if any of you have had chicken pox as a kid, but essentially if you have chicken pox, it'll be like, hi, I'm back when you're like 80, when you have like herpes zoster. So that just, it just like hides and chills in your dorsal root ganglia and then comes back and then it's like, hey, your immune system's weaker now, I'm just gonna come back and kind of screw you over. So these things are called like kind of chronic carriers and it just chills out until taking a time of immunocompromised uh, health and then you'll um, burst down again. So hepatitis is also another, another one. Oh yeah, so more specifically focusing on micro uh, introduction to like what are actually bacteria, right? This is really fun. Like we need to think of bacteria as like, like robots slash Gundam slash anything that you can tinker with and create anything, right? Because like these things, like you can literally say like, okay, I want to, like, I was going to do activity, but I think we didn't have time. So I was going to literally draw like one and then be like, all right, what, what, what do you guys want this bacteria to have? So essentially it's just like make your own teddy bear, but we're going to do like make your own bacteria. Okay. So essentially bacteria are prokaryotes, they're like your dumb cells, but like actually do a lot of things. While well, they're chemically similar, you know, your uh, DNA, RNA, and all of those things, but they're actually structurally very different. So like eukaryotes, right? Like, whoa, it's like mega brain. Like you have all of these good stuff, like nucleus, mitochondria, centriole, blah, blah, blah. Like you've covered all of that in your um, earlier biochem lectures. But prokaryotes, right? So the thing about prokaryotes is that they are no, like, they don't have like specific like nucleus. It's like they're not membrane bound uh, subcellular organelles. So like no mitochondria and all of that. And they're really, they're really quite small. And there's three main shapes. All right, so what three main shapes do we have? So we have, wait, where did my image go? Is it not on there? Oh, there we go. Was that an animation? Okay, <laughs> lol. Um, so, Essentially, types of prokaryotes, so we've got, they lack nuclei and organelles, I've already talked about that, and the shapes. All right, so we've got our coccus, right? Like, how do we remember it? Well, we've got the O in the middle of coccus, and the C's kind of look like O, so it's, so you know it's circular, like the word tells you it's circular, so um, coccus, right? Like, it's a circle. And then bacilli, or, um, yeah, I think that's how they pronounce bacilli. So like, so you see the L's, right? Like they look like rod shaped and if you look at it, like you can tell they're long and they're rotty. And spiral, if you don't know what spiral is, like just kind of think of a pasta, but like everyone knows spiral, right? So I'm not, 
Yep, cool. <laughs> Just look at the word. That's how you remember it. Like, don't overthink it. So common features, uh, this is just a quick overview. So like peptidic lichen, out, outer membrane, uh, plasma membrane, and all of this, I'll go into detail onto each one. This is just kind of a summary about like the basic starter packs. All right, so cell wall structure, right? So what are peptidic lichen? Essentially, they're just like carbohydrates and they need to provide this like shell, provide this strength of structure to the bacterial wall. And they're unique to bacteria. To create this protective wall, as I said. Now, what is gram staining? Okay, I always thought gram staining meant like the um, the purple ones are like heavier. That's why they're called gram positive. But turns out it was just some white dude who discovered it and just called it um, gram staining because like eponym eponymous, like it's just like naming it after these people. All right. So so what though, right? Like what's why are these important? Well, they're really important in differentiating the different types of bacteria that we kind of have. Now we can split bacteria into like um, the majority of bacteria into like gram positive and gram negative. So then gram positive, just think about like how do we know it's positive? All right, so if it's if you look at a histological kind of or like stained image, like if it's darker, then it's purple, right? Like purple is darker than red. Like do your rainbow color thing, like red, orange, and all that stuff. But like purple's darker than red, like hundred percent, right? And then. What does that mean? If it's darker, this means like there's probably more stuff, right? If, if there's more stuff, then it's probably thicker. And if there's, and if there's, if, and if it's thicker, then it's like, has more of this like peptidoglycan. And more of something means it's positive. So it's gram positive. Whereas light red, reverse logic, um, red, less absorbed, thinner, less peptidoglycan. So therefore it's gram negative. Someone was also saying like, Red in stock market is bad, so it goes down, and therefore it's negative. Like whatever floats a boat, but this, this, yeah. So this is how I, how I kind of remember it, like logically, step by step. So cell wall structure, essentially, this is what I meant before. Like if you look at on the top one, that's gram. What is it, guys? That is gram positive because it's purple, right? And then if we look at it on the bottom, it's gram negative because it's red and then red is bad because stock markets crashing rip coronavirus economy blah 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 um so yeah so exceptions well we like not all bacteria are like gram saying hepatito like there's like some with like myco uh mycolic acid so this is like a myco uh mycobacterium tuberculosis and they've got like this like waxy lipid layer um you have to use something called like an acid fasting there's like a there's the, there's the other name for it, it's like a Neil Z star stain. I, I think I pronounced it wrong, or um, probably completely bludgeoned the name, but that's just another name for acid fasting, and that's usually what we say. So, the way to remember it mycolic acid, mycobacteria, myco, myco, so they're the same thing, or like they're related. All right, so flagella. Okay, so it's essentially like a whipped boy, right? Like it's a tail, and you can more than one. Like I'm sure everyone knows, like if you did bio or something, you have like the like the arms everywhere, and it's just like the whirling, right? So the tail cannot be one; it can be one and both and all, all over, like whatever floats your boat. Once again, like kind of kinky, but okay. Um, so it's made of a single fiber. It's like only one tail. Like you don't have like um, many tails weaved together. No, it's just like one tail makes up one. So one fiber makes up one tail, and getting on with the cool kids, like the memes, like white blood cells need all of these things, you know, to move around the endothelial, uh, endothelium layers and stuff, but for jealous of like, oh, brr. okay, next. <laughs> David, can I please remind you that these are recorded, like we're going to have these on file for like, for everyone to see. Oh, uh, this is perfect. I love this. Oh, God. Okay, so Fimbria, like they can, the main, the main thing for Fimbria is like, just think of these as blue tack, right? Like the blue tack, but like hairy blue tack. So essentially, like they just like stick out of people, or like, not people, sorry, bacteria, and they can stick to walls, they can stick to each other, they can stick to surfaces, and this allows them to create like this army of bacteria, and they're super strong like, like this. It will be hard for antibacterials to kind of penetrate, and so that's why I'm always saying like, you can't think of microbi microbiology as being boring. You gotta think of it as like, you're playing like an RPG kind of game and everything's like coming together. And like, they think of tactics and you as the like doctor, you as the um, scientist, 
you need to think of like um, strategic ways as to like, all right, what's, what's one of the characteristics that I can exploit? If you keep thinking like that, it will actually really help you with learning the drugs because that's all the drugs are doing. They're finding something that's going on with the bacteria and trying to target it to exploit it and to destroy them. So it's a constant struggle. All right, so in the stereo gonorrhea, right? So hairy balls. So it is diplococci. Um, so this is one of the examples that Mary keeps using. And like, you have to just visualize all of this stuff. It helps you remember so much, okay? So diplococci, two balls, all right? So what is it? Two balls, sexual organs, and it's also a sexually transmitted disease, right? Gonorrhea. And why, why does it do that? Well, because of this fimbria that we're talking about, the hairy blue tack, right? Like it sticks to the urolo urological mucosal membranes. And also, what do these hairs do? Well, so they stick to the mucosal surface and can help them move around and stick to each other. And that's where sometimes the discharge and kind of get from gonorrhea happens. And they sometimes get so much, like they get stuck together so much that they form like these nodules. And these nodules can like be like quite big and it's really gross. Okay. <laughs> So capsules, um, so its street name is like glycocalyx. It's kind of edgy, you know, like has an X at the end of its Instagram username. So it's like, like a sugar cup and it's like really hard. So it prevents like whatever's like the gooey stuff inside of the bacteria to be like not dried out, right? Like, so this capsule is like a hard nut and it prevents the beatings of the police. Who's the police? Well, the white blood cells. That's out, like the, that's like the government, like you kind of protect yourself. But because of this hard capsule, the glycocalyx, it prevents being attacked and phagocytose. It can also look like kind of a normal cell and that's what uh, we call molecular mimicry. So yeah, Meredith, like, lived, like I was looking through her slides from last year and essentially she goes through pretty much like I think six or seven bacteria in one go and like it's really overwhelming so just like chill out she doesn't actually test you very specifically on each specific one so don't worry too much about it um she will go through over in active learning just try to learn as much as you can but just learn about like how bacteria work so this is what I'm saying like you don't need to like learn about this specific assassin in the enemy's team rather you should learn about the tactics about how to actually defeat micro micro bacteria and like parasites later on. So yeah, I've had like three cups of coffee. I woke up at like five. Um, so viruses, so what are viruses, right? Like they're, they're these like small as things. Coronavirus, everyone knows. Um, they're acellular because they needed a host kind of to survive. And without the host, they can't kind of like they, they're not alive, you know, like they're kind of dead inside, but they're only like alive inside, if that makes sense, because it is only within the host are they alive. So by hijacking the host, so viruses, it's like the same as your like laptop, right? If you get a virus on your laptop, your laptop becomes someone else's laptop. So if your virus gets into your body, then like your body, you just got like swarmed and um, the virion is like the body of the virus but gets into your body and starts producing more of its bodies. So there's like so many bodies here, right? So how do we actually understand this virus in comparison to like bacteria? So bacteria, basically they can just chill out, but viruses, just remember that viruses need the host organ to survive. And there's also a few things that it helps the virus just like chill out in the air or on benches. So that includes a capsid coat, a little bit like the pepsidoglycan uh, walls on the uh, bacteria, um, but in this case, it's like a more a different chemical makeup. Uh, virus genomes, it still needs a bit of nucleic acid to like hijack the um, the protein synthesis machinery that you have in your nucleus with, and the lipid and protein membrane. So that's just like you know. So basically, um, I need. Uh, so basically, like you have, if this is your virus, right, and then this is your cell. So then the virus enters the cell, and it's within the cell. And then it shoots out of the virus. But as it shoots out, it drags like it drags like the fat layer with it. So then it suddenly has this other coat of fat layer. And that fat layer actually comes from the host cell it's already taken from. 
Yeah, and these are the AirPods, slight flex, anyways. Um, so classification of viruses, um, there's like your icosahedral boys, so that's your like hexa hexagon kind of shapes. And then you also have your helical ones, they just do your spins. Essentially, this isn't that important, you just need to know these shapes kind of exist. And envelopes, they're pretty important in knowing that presence of absence of um, them uh, helps us decide which treatment to give. Um, micro, wait, is that it? There's no other slides after that, I'm pretty sure. Oh, okay, so I'll just finish this off. Yeah, so viral replication, this, these, these, yeah, so next one, sorry. Um, yep, so viral replication, like these slides are, this is pretty important for when you guys do your influenza tutorial. So this is pretty important, right? Like, because attachment, it's very logical. So like, you got to hook on first, right? Like, once I've hooked on, then you can be like, all right, um, I'm, I'm, I'm in. And then you're like, okay, but how do I actually go in and like infiltrate? So you penetrate the phospholipid bilayer. So this is something that um, influenza viruses use called uh, hemagglutinin. Um, and then they go in to actually hijack the protein replication, control C, control V, control C, control V, right? Copy and paste, copy and paste. And then it goes into assembly. So it's just like plagiarizes some of the stuff from like its own nucleic acid. And then ta-da, like a billion little viruses that kind of like pop out of the cell. And ultimately you have the SpongeBob meme of I'm going to head out and it exits with the key of uh, neuraminidase in in influenza viruses. So ultimately, I just want to say though, for microbiology, like please, like don't think it's boring. Like it's actually really fascinating. I still wouldn't do infectious disease because my dad would kill me that apparently I'm gonna die every day of seeing COVID. But um, I think like legit, just like think of this as like a really fun thing that you can do and just like try and make stories about like, all right, this virus, like super deadly, but like it's actually kind of dumb in this way. So then me as the general of like fighting this war against the bacteria, we can use this specific strategy. Oh, or like you can be like, oh, this bacteria, it has a lot of fibrillae. So maybe if we can somehow reduce the amount of fibrillae that it has, we can um, make this a bacterial uh, standard kind of thing. Anyways, I've like gone on a bit of a madman, uh, storyline of the uh, basic microbial stuff. I hope to be back soon with some more um, antibacterial stuff later. So keep an eye out. Okay, so. <laughs> okay, so um, I'm gonna finish off microbiology um, talking about some strategies for control. It's a little bit boring. It's not as engaging as David's talk just was. <laughs> um, um, because a lot of it, unfortunately, is just like you're just learning like techniques and things that like hospitals and all of like different like workplaces, like what we use to implement to like kill bacteria. Um, so we'll just get started. Um, we can we can do like the build your own bacteria thing if we decide to do another session like this week. You can probably just like chill and play that anyway. Yes, okay, please. so. Um, this was one of my favorite Meredith lectures. Um, you can tell if it was my favorite lecture or not because I actually took notes in this lecture. I have like one note, like notes, guys. It's like, it's, they're really pretty as well. So like, you know, I really paid attention this, in this lecture. Anyway, so the chain of infection, basically um, it's this, oh wait, can you see my pointer? Can you see my mouse? Yeah, okay. So it's like, basically this is like the chain of infection and we need to break one of these particular steps to allow for infection control and to like stop like nosocomial infections. It's really, really important for nosocomial infection control, which we are going to get into in a sec. Okay. So basically we're going to go through like each of these steps in a little bit more detail. So like, don't worry, we'll come back to the diagram. Um, so basically first step is reservoir. That's, <coughs> that's where the agent, survives and multiplies. So basically without the reservoir, the agent can't like do anything. So there are some types of reservoirs, um, humans, animals, and inanimate objects. Um, so humans, you can have symptomatic um, and you can also have carriers. Um, just, we've already kind of like gone through this. Um, David's already kind of gone through this in detail. So we just, we'll just ignore this. Um, animals um, just know that they're kind of like, you can kind of assume like they're hard to deal with. 
you know, just common sense. Um, and inanimate objects, they're also called fomites. Um, so yeah, reservoirs, like just, it's kind of simple, just where the agent lives. Um, next in the, cha uh, the chain of infection, transmission. So how does the agent actually spread? So there are a few, few not a few, a lot of ways that um, you can actually have transmission. So first, contact. So you can have direct and indirect contact. So obviously direct is if it's just like host, host. Indirect is host and then you have like a secretion or something that like comes out and then like the host touches it and then like goes to the next host. Uh, droplet, so like influenza, SARS, all of your great um, examples we have. Airborne, tuberculosis, varicella, blah. Inoculation, so that's via an insect bite or sharps injuries. So insect bites like mosquitoes where you get like malaria, sharps injuries, HIV, hepatitis B and C. Vehicles, so that can be through water or food or through medical instruments. And then last of all, we have uh, transplacental or in utero. Um, there's an acronym that Meredith gives you to remember the particular like things that can be transmitted through uh, like in utero, which is torch. Um, just like, yeah, this is unfortunately, a lot of this is just like a memorization thing and just general knowledge of how, how things work. Okay, so portals of entry and exit. So this is how does the agent actually leave their reservoir and then enter a new host. So these, these are your types of portals over here. You've got respiratory, like conjunct conjunctiva, which is like in your eyes, urogenital, gastrointestinal, skin, placenta, blah, blah, blah. But mainly you just look at like on this diagram, portals of exit. So leaving the reservoir, so they can leave through excretions, secretions, droplets, skin, and how they actually enter. So it has to be broken skin. That's one of the keys that we were talking about in immunology, especially. So it has to be broken skin. They can come through mucous membrane, gastrointestinal, respiratory, any of the, the tracts. Um, so you need to have a susceptible host. So this is just kind of finding out how the host, like usually it's like a human, um, how has the host actually been impaired and how it has, how will that, like lead to infection so usually it's just they have like underlying disease are they like you know compromised any of the extreme ages so if in the very young and the very old um the immune system isn't as functional as it would be if you were in like in your 20s like you're young and healthy um so basically this is just a list just know some of these um a lot of this is common sense so just yeah um okay so now we get on to how, to how do we actually control microbial growth? So how do we like kill all of these, like the stuff that we want to get rid of? So there are three levels to actually controlling microbial growth. The first level is cleaning. So that's like your simple just cleaning. So you're removing bacteria off of any organic matter. Typically um, in this context, it's like bandages and linen. Um, so any, I'm going to say moist a lot. And guys, I just want to tell you that this is like my least favorite word ever. So like, I'm literally like experiencing PTSD while I'm like giving you this, giving you this lecture anyway. So they should be removed immediately because that actually facilitates bacterial growth. So cleaning actually has to occur prior to any disinfecting or sterilizing procedure. And then that leads us to level two, which is disinfection. So this is the removal or killing of most viable microorganisms. So that can be physical, um, it can be chemical. We'll go through like a few different techniques for disinfection. Um, and just to clarify like different definitions that are often used, some words, antiseptic is skin disinfection. Sanitization is object disinfection. Just vocabulary, just so you know. Um, and then level three is sterilization. So kind of in the name, um, it's removal or killing of all viable microorganisms, including those that may produce spores. And once again, that can be physical or chemical, but we're gonna go into that. Okay, so these are some factors that actually influence microbial growth. Um, it's in the lecture. I just decided to put it in here as well. Um, and the level of microbial growth control 
is going to depend on the object you're going to use with the highest risk. So any equipment that can penetrate skin or a mucous membrane, that's considered having the highest risk. So those um, you need to sterilize. Any equipment, um, so there's, there's some equipment that will require specialized decontamination. So those like endoscopes, respiratory equipment, don't really, yeah, just know that, I guess. Um, and any equipment that may contain skin but not penetrate, that's considered having a lower risk. So you can use just like disinfection or just cleaning, depending on the actual object. But I do have a list at the very end on the like different kinds of objects and the different kinds of like cleaning methods that we will use. Okay, so going to sterilization in a lot more detail because sterilization is obviously one that we used, we use like more often, I would say. So there are a lot of different types. First, we have heat. Basically, you just like cook the bacteria um, and then the bacteria will die. Um, it's very efficient as long as the object can actually withstand the temperature that you are going to subject it to. Because for example, if you use like something that's gonna melt or something that's just gonna like, you know, it's gonna like compromise the object itself. You don't want to actually subject it to these really high temperatures. You want to find something else that will actually sterilize. So moist heat yeah, um, is 121 degrees for 15 minutes or 134 degrees for three and a half minutes. Um, can someone clarify for me? Like, do we actually, do they actually need to know that figure? Like I can't quite remember if that was something we needed to memorize or if this is just like general knowledge, but Nah, I think maybe just know it like yeah it's, it's a cool yeah. fact to know but like I don't think you really need to memorize the actual like temperature um, it's done in something called an autoclave basically it's um, like basically combines like moist heat with pressure so an increase in pressure is obviously gonna like kind of like chemistry like increase in pressure is going to increase your boiling point so therefore you're going to have like higher heat so like kill more bacteria yay Woo. Um, and it causes um, basically the moist heat just causes an inactivation of proteins and then opposite to that you've got dry heat so dry heat takes longer than moist heat to actually like sterilize any object so that's 170 degrees for an hour or 160 degrees for two hours and basically that, that's an inactivation of the cell components by oxidation um, you kind of just need to know that there's like moist heat dry heat like you kind of just need to know that but this is like kind of cool facts to know as well um, radiation, basically this is, um, we use them a lot for like sterilizing surfaces um, and that they do it by damaging the DNA of the microbes. So you've got two kinds that, oh, well, you, you actually have more, but the two kinds that Meredith wants you to know. So you've got UV, it's not very penetrating actually. It's, so that means it's very good for disinfecting any surfaces, medical instruments, fluid and air. Um, and then you have ionizing radiation. So these actually break down DNA. So they're very good for heat sensitive materials. So anything that you can't like actually like cook the bacteria, you just like use ionizing radiation. So we use it for like some food, some disposable items and obviously heat sensitive materials. We have more. So filtration, this literally physically, like it's in the name, like fil filtration. So it physically removes any microorganisms that, um, from like heat sensitive liquids and gases. So you use them for, you use filtration for any materials that can't be sterilized by any other method. So you've got like no other choice to use filtration. And then last of all, we have chemicals. So we're gonna go into this chemical, um, once again, more detail. Um, so it's used for equipment or materials that can't withstand high temperature. So um, yeah. Um, and ethylene oxide gas is the most commonly used. It's like a very traditional method that's used for chemical sterilization. Um, people like it because it leaves no residue and it's able, like, because obviously it's a gas, you can get it into like tubes and stuff, which is really great. Okay, so these are some examples. So for chemical disinfectant. So this is just a list of some commonly used ones that you'll see around hospital in your medical practice. So chlorine for any spills, um, iodine is for skin preparation for surgery. I think a lot of people know that. Chlorhexidine, that's used in like your hand rub. So you'll find them like around like med building or like around the hospital when you're just like using the, the hand rub that like, like evaporates really quickly. 
Um, it's also used as a surgical scrub for your scrubbing. Um, alcohol in alcohol wipes. So the choice of your chemical disinfectant or chemical sterilization, like chemical, will depend on a number of things. And this is just what it, what it depends on. Um, yeah. Okay. So this is the list I was talking about before about choosing what to actually clean with, like what level you would want to do. So you've got three different classifications of devices. So you've got critical items, which will require sterilization. So this is an, any object that will enter sterile tissue, vascular system, or will pierce a mucous membrane. So obviously these must be free of microorganisms, including spores. So this is like your surgical equipment, any catheters, implants, scalpel, like kind of self-explanatory. Then you have your semi-critical items. So you will require a high level of disinfection. So like probably like a chemical disinfection rather than just like using like antiseptic. Um, so these are objects coming into contact with mucous membranes or non-intact skin. So these need to be free from all microorganisms with the exception of a high number of spores. So these include like flexible endoscope. Well, you can read the examples yourself. And then last of all, we have non-critical items. So these require like either an intermediate or a low level of disinfection. So these are objects coming in, with in, coming in contact with intact skin and not mucous membranes. So like your stethoscopes. So usually you can use just like an alcohol wipe. It's like, especially for like stethoscopes and stuff. Um, and I think that is the end. No, it's not the end. Oh God, okay. Last of all, we're going to talk about Nosocomial infections. Basically, someone did an oops, like someone didn't follow regulation and they'd caused um, a nosocomial infection. Um, what a nosocomial infection is, did I skip a slide? Yes, I did. Um, what a nosocomial infection is, it's a hospital acquired infection. So when something actually goes wrong in the hospital sterilization or disinfection procedures, which allows for infections by opportunistic pathogens. The one you need to remember for this, Staph aureus, because Meredith loves, one, Meredith loves Staph aureus as an example. Whenever you get like a question from her and she's like, what like bacteria might have caused this? Like just always say like Staph aureus and it's probably it. Um, but uh, Staph aureus is really important for nosocomial infection because you'll talk about golden staph. So like MRSA um, and yeah, it's, it's not good because it's basically like so resistant that we don't like, there's no way for us to kill it. And you don't want it to get to that point in a hospital, especially. Just, just on those infections, infections. Um, when you go to like wards later on, just make sure like you don't remember. Oh, like I remember back in PSP in year one, they said nosocomial means it was someone stuffed up. Like it's true, but like a lot of procedures all have rules risks right like it's not like they did it on purpose or anything yeah like, yeah <laughs> even 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 when people say like iatrogenic so it's like caused by the carer like caused by the doctor like a lot of times like it, it's like if you're doing a surgery there's always risks risks for complications and like sometimes infections just do happen especially in immunocompromised patients and like another example adding on to staph aureus is uh, c difficile especially um so like in patients who have bad immune systems like you can get like these other infections within these hospital settings. And um, that's why we want to get patients home as fast as possible. It's not that um, we accidentally, like we might have accidentally done it, but it's like definitely not on purpose. Mm, yeah. So the main thing about nosocomial infections is we want to learn how to prevent them because obviously we don't want to get like nosocomial infections, right? So we've got all of these like procedures in place to actually prevent us from like make it low as low risk as possible because as david said sometimes it just happens by like the off chance so you want to make sure you're like it's as like decreased probability as much as possible until it's just like it's literally just by chance so this is the list of all of the things that we do as like preventative measures um i i can't really tell say anything else other than just like know some of these preventative measures um and Did someone say hand washing <laughs> yeah like please please yeah especially uh, especially in like coronavirus times now like these are like more important than ever but um yeah just know some of these preventative measures um and yeah i think that's it from me
Yep, I did parasites. Let me. Do you want to share screen, screen and screen. I can stop sharing? Oh, yeah, I'll, I'll share. Okay, cool. I'll share then. Um, one sec. Okay. Do I still remember though what parasites are? Yep. I think you guys should be able to see. So parasites, pretty sure if you still have the same lectures as last year, this will not be given by Meredith, who normally gives all your microbiology lectures. Um, I think she invites someone um, from the Alfred who has more expertise in the area of parasites. Uh, the lecture is like pretty, pretty full on um, because the lecturer is obviously um, very uh, excited and as well as into uh, talking about parasites because that's part of his day-to-day -day job. Um, so all I've given here is a quick summary and, ta and summary tables for essentially the main parasites that you should familiarize yourself with. So first of all, what is a parasite? So paras uh, David already talks about this. So these are essentially organisms that are harmful to the host. So when you have a host parasite relationship, this relationship will always essentially favour the parasite. So it's not symbiotic in any means. The parasite, um, essentially, you can think of it as they leech off your Netflix and they don't pay for it. Um, and the main parasites that you will get introduced to um, you guys in first year are protozoa and helminths. So let's start off with protozoa first. These guys are unicellular eukaryotes. And these are the important ones that um, you'll get to know this year, including malaria, trichomonas, toxoplasma, and giardia. If I had to rank them in terms of high yield to low yield, I would go malaria, giardia, trichomonas, toxoplasma. But there's only four, so if you can familiarize yourself with all four, that would be best. So the first one is malaria, and this is probably one of the most important ones, hence this slide has a lot of stuff on it. Um, so malaria, most of you probably have already heard about it. It's essentially caused by uh, plasmodium. And plasmodium, there's five different species that can all cause malaria in humans. The main one that you need to remember is that plasmodium falciparum causes uh, the most severe form of malaria. Uh, and that's one of the questions that you might possibly get. So know that there's five species. I wouldn't bother memorizing all five. Just know that falciparum is the most severe. The symptoms you get for malaria include fever, chills, and sweat. And something that the lecturer will essentially talk about over and over again is that fever from a return, returning traveller is malaria until proven otherwise. Uh, diagnosis for malaria, you can do thick and thin blood films and you can do what's called a GM stain. And this is, it's different from a gram stain. It's essentially a stain of um, your blood smear uh, that is specifically designed to identify uh, malaria. Uh, treatment for malaria. Uh, so quinine is actually an old treatment. Uh, most we typically don't use it anymore um, because there's a huge side effect of ringing in your ears. Um, the other one is doxycycline. However, once again, that's a drug with large side effects. And currently there's no vaccine. Uh, prevention for malaria includes setting up mosquito nets as well as residual spraying. Um, as well as prophylaxis for any travellers who are going to areas where uh, you know that there is malaria uh, predominant in the area. And the transmission of malaria is, not, is typically via a female uh, mosquito vectors um, because female mosquitoes essentially only drink blood from humans uh, when they're pregnant and they need that extra uh, nutrition they get from our blood. So we start off with a mosquito, a female mosquito. She's hungry, she needs blood, and she's a carrier, which means she's got um, the sporozoites in her. So she bites us, and as she's biting us and eating up our blood, she's also uh, injecting these sporozoites into our blood at the same time. These sporozoites will enter our red blood cells, and in our red blood cells, they can essentially do two things. They can either do asexual reproduction or they can do sexual uh, reproduction. So when they do uh, asexual replication in the blood, uh, they normally do it in your liver cells. And once they re reproduce many, many times, this will cause your liver cells to rupture and they'll release something called merozoite. So this is like a more uh, 
this is the next type of like the more mature version of the sporozoites that are in your blood now. Um, when they go through the sexual cycle, uh, these merozoites will then produce uh, gametocytes. And next time when a different mosquito comes and bites you, when they essentially drink up your blood, the mosquito will also drink up some of these gametocytes when they bite you. And these gametocytes will then mate and undergo meiosis to produce sporozytes again in the mosquito. So that's why mosquitoes are vectors. However, mosquitoes aren't actually negatively impacted um, by this uh, production of sporozoites in their body. Okay. So the next one is Trichomonas. It's an STI that typically affects women. Um, it's an anaerobic parasite that causes ulceration of the cervix. Um, and it's typically found through doing a pap smear. And a buzzword for this is when you have a symptom where you have smelly and frothy vaginal discharge, and you can also get lower abdominal discomfort. Um, but that's a buzzword, that's why I put it in bold. Diagnosis for this includes a wet mat as well as a pap smear, and treatment can be done via metronidazole. Uh, moving on to toxoplasma. Uh, so toxoplasma uh, can infect your CNS as well as your lymph nodes and it's obtained from kittens. So the most common way of actually getting toxoplasma is if you eat food that's contaminated by cat feces. So that's another buzzword for toxoplasma. Majority of it, so 80% is self-limiting, so you will recover. Um, however, typically in people who are immunodeficient, um, it can cause more severe problems, such as cere cerebral toxoplasmosis or cerebral lesions. And you can diagnose this via serology, histology, or radiology. And the treatment includes uh, the two drugs that I've listed there. Uh, the next one is Giardia. Um, this one has flagella. And as you can see in the picture, they have this very, uh, I guess, characterizing shape. Um, so as soon as you see something that looks like that with flagella, you can think Giardia. And they multiply and colonize in your small bowel. So symptoms include abdominal pain, nausea. However, the biggest buzzword for giardia is if you get greasy, bowel-smelling, floaty stool. And your stools float because they're full of fat. Um, so diagnosis is via a stool exam. Treatment via metronidazole and tenidazole. And the best way to prevent it is essentially just not drinking contaminated water in the first place. Um Sorry, just go. Could you just, <clears throat> could you just go back? Yep. So for Giardia, the way you remember it is like once again, Giardia is a character, and Giardia has a smiley face. So you can see the two eyes and the nose and the smile. So Giardia smiley face, not a nice bug though. Yeah, not a nice bug. You don't want it. Okay. So now moving on to helminths. So these guys, you can think of them as worms. So they're parasitic worms um, that can infect through things like skin penetration, ingestion, or um, through larvae getting into you and then maturing. So the important ones to know, um, so you have your roundworms called nematodes, and within that category, you've got hookworms, filariasis, and enterobias. You've also got your tapeworms, as well as your flukes. So uh, hookworms. Uh, they can look something like this. They look kind of scary and um, they look like they've got almost something that looks like really sharp teeth. And this is what causes most of your symptoms. Um, so you can get an itchy skin and that's essentially when they first clamp onto your skin and burrow through your skin to get into your body. Um, then you can get diarrhea and abdominal pain once they essentially colonize your uh, gastrointestinal system. And because they have these teeth that can bite onto you, uh, this can cause bleeding, which therefore leads to your other symptom of iron deficiency. A treat, treatment for this um, would be albendazole. And over on the right here is the um, infection cycle. So uh, normally there'll be a host that's already been infected with um, the adult hookworms in their small intestine, and the eggs will essentially. Uh, appear in the feces and then the larvae will hatch and the most common way that hookworms get into you is that they actually penetrate through your skin in your feet so if you're like working um, in bare feet and it just so happens that there are hookworms uh, in the soil then they can essentially 
penetrate through your skin in your feet and migrate all the way up to your small intestine, mature as adults there, and then the cycle continues. The other one is um, filariasis. And once again, another vector for uh, filariasis is your mosquitoes. And there's four different species, uh, not high yield though, I would not recommend you memorize the four uh, species of mosquitoes. So the symptoms of filariasis, um, at the beginning, when your larvae are essentially still in the process of maturing, it's typically asymptomatic. Um, but what happens is uh, the larvae essentially grow in your lymphatic system. And once they get to a certain size and they've matured, this will cause blockages in your lymphatic system. And that's why you have a lymphedema, which is essentially um, swelling. And typically it's swelling in the lower extremities of your body, such as your leg. And diagnosis is a midnight smear of your blood. And the reason uh, this happens is I'll explain in the life cycle of it in just a second, but treatment for it is doxycycline. So if we have a look at the life cycle of uh, filariasis, you have your vector, which is a mosquito. It bites you and it deposits the larvae uh, into you. The larvae will then migrate to your lymphatic system where they grow, as I said, um, and then when they essentially mature uh, to a certain size, they're going to start causing blockages leading to lymphedema. Now, the female worms will actually then produce the uh, new microscopic worms called microfilarae, um, and they essentially go into your blood, they swarm into your blood at night. Uh, so that's why you normally can diagnose it through a blood smear. Uh, around midnight because that's when these new microscopic worms are in your blood and they pull into the blood um, at night because they were essentially waiting for mosquitoes to bite you again so at night they go into your blood new mosquitoes are hungry they come they bite you and then when they bite you they also uh, ingest some of these uh, new microscopic worms and now these new baby worms are then going to mature um, into larvae in the mosquito the mosquito now has the larvae, they're now a vector, and then they go off and bite someone else. So, and then the cycle repeats itself again. Okay, and then enterobias. So this is a threadworm that mainly infects children. So the worms live in the intestine and females essentially will migrate out at night to lay eggs right outside, like just outside the anus. And so that's one of the reasons why the main symptom for enterobias is you'll have like an itchy butt. Um, that's typically when the female crawls out at night to lay its eggs. So typically your symptoms will get worse at night. Uh, the diagnosis is actually um, pretty, pretty simple. You can literally get like sellotape. Um, and in the morning, you, you'll essentially use the tape, you'll stick it onto like, let's say the baby's bottom. And then you, put the tape under a microscope and you can actually see the eggs that have just been laid. So that's like one of the quickest ways to diagnose uh, enterobias. And the reason why it's mainly uh, infecting small children is that they essentially haven't gotten into the habit of good hand hygiene. Um, and they essentially will scratch their bottom, don't wash their hands and then eat with their fingers. And so they're now ingesting more of the eggs. And the treatment for enterobias is mebendazole. Um, and typically, the lecturer did say that if you find that this young child has enterobias, uh, you should most likely treat the whole family because chances are the whole family now also has it. And then just this last slide is on ectoparasites. Um, not really high yield, but just know that ecto, so that means they live outside the host's body, typically on the skin. Um, and common ones you'll see include scabies, uh, lice, uh, ticks, and mice. And I think that is it. Yep. Um, okay, so like there is still quite a lot of slides left. Um, we still have like another 30 slides um, and we probably can't get it done within the next like 20 minutes. Um, so what we'll do is we'll probably, um, we'll probably postpone the second bit of this like week nine stuff. Um, yeah, uh, we'll postpone the week nine stuff till next time and we'll probably combine that with like our how to study kind of Anki session as well. Um, yeah, how does that sound, guys? Yeah, good.
Yeah. Um, yes, yeah, so that's what we'll probably do. Um, so next time we'll finish off week nine. Uh, we probably won't do a quiz, um, but we'll do our like how we study kind of funky thingy. My Bob. Yeah. Um, but yeah. Uh, does anyone have any questions to finish off? Okay, cool. Um, yeah, enjoy your lectures for this week. Um, make sure to rock up to the clinical school sessions at night. Uh, they should be helpful. Uh, otherwise, Yay. yeah, we'll catch we'll you. We'll see some of you there, hopefully. Yeah, yeah. see some of you there. Yeah, exactly. All right, see you later, guys.